what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same and right now. I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of inspiredinsider.com, where we talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And today is no other. I'm going to introduce in a second, uh, Tom Bozo of Homeboy Industries before I introduce Tom formally. Tom, I always like to mention other episodes people should check out on Inspired Insider. And uh, we had Dave DeRocher, who's executive director of the Other Side Academy. And these are other, you know, people will hear in this interview how inspirational, amazing this um, social enterprise and organization is, uh, Homeboy Industries. So uh, Dave uh, DeRocher was actually uh, executive director of the Other Side Academy, which is he was he used to work in Delancey Street for eight years, where he rose to become the managing director. And uh, this is when a judge gave him a sentence of 29 years in prison and he got arrested at 13 and was in and out of prison, you know, many, many times. And uh, so he was faced with that decision. So listen to that one. Uh, Dr. Erica Miller um, is an inspirational speaker entrepreneur. Um, She survived the Holocaust and was in the Israeli Air Force. And she came out of that and grew a chain of mental health clinics to over 40 clinicians. She talks about facing a Nazi guard at at seven and the brutality she witnessed in the camp. So check that out as well. Um, This episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships and partnerships. And we do that by helping you run your podcast. You know, we are an easy button for people to launch and run their podcast. And for me, Tom, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way over the past over decade to do that by profiling their company, their story on the podcast, shouting from the rooftops what they're doing, what they're working on, so other people can discover it as well. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. Um, You can go to rise25.com, learn more, email us for any questions, happy to answer them. So I'm excited to introduce Thomas Vozo, left a lucrative career in corporate America uh, and convinced there had to be a better way to define success. In 2012, Tom became the first ever CEO of Homeboy Industries, which is the largest and most successful gang intervention, rehabilitation, and reentry program in the world. And Tom's journey goes from helping grow a company from $50 million to $300 million to billion dollar revenues because his last corporate role was CEO of $1.8 billion Aramark Uniform and Career Apparel Group to now, volunteer unpaid CEO of a nonprofit built on compassion, empathy, social justice, and most importantly, check out the book. Check out the book, The Homeboy Way, The Radical Approach to Business and Life, and you can go to homeboyindustries.org. They have lots of merch, also amazing t-shirts, hats, and you know, by supporting um, what they're doing there, you can make donations, you can buy merch, and much more, so you can do that and just spread the word, I want Homeboy Industries is doing. So Tom, thanks for joining me. Yeah. Thank you for having me, Jeremy. You know, there's so much to dig into here. And um, I just want to start off with, um, there's so many stories, right? And I want to start off with just a story from, you know, I spent the weekend watching video after video about Homeboy Industries. uh, And so I want you to share what comes to mind, what's a memorable story um, from when you first started and what's changed you? Yeah. So look, at Homeboy Industries, we have so many, so many stories of, of people of, of how they've transformed their lives. And when I, I love my time at Homeboy and, and it's, you know, at Homeboy, we talk about being part of the community and to your comment on relationship, there's relationships that makes a difference to help people leave that gang lifestyle and leave the life of crime. And so when I came in the Homeboy Industries, I came in as a, as a volunteer, a former board member asked me to get involved and and I had time on my hands, so I was volunteering. And uh, immediately, they, you know, because an older guy with gray hair, they, you know, homeboy has eight social enterprise businesses. So they said, "Hey, go help out in the businesses and see if you can help us there." And I'll tell you more about how I got involved with homeboy in a bit. But the, the story was, we have a merchandise store, and we, you and you just uh, you just did a good job promoting. We sell, uh, you know, shirts and hats and homeboy gear. And I remember going in uh, and meeting Amos, who who was a who was what we call a trainee working on our in our merchandise store. And uh, Amos had just gotten out of prison, probably like four or five months prior. And so 
uh, I'm showing up and then we have a manager of the store and we have two trainees running the store and, and the manager um, was out a lot, but Amos did a good job of stepping in when the manager was out and running the store and never had worked elsewhere before, but had a good mind about things and was dedicated, came in on Saturdays, cleaned up the store. Okay. So point of the story is now this is my first month of being there. I come in the following uh, Monday morning and, and I say, well, where's Amos? Well, turns out Amos got picked up by the police and got put back into prison, not for a new charge that happened since he left prison, for a charge that happened 15 years prior. And so here I thought, here, this was my first really blast in my brain of, wow, here's somebody working really hard. I, what I saw, working really hard, trying to turn their life around, doing everything right, not making a lot of money, not scraping by, taking care of their kids. And it's something that happened 15 years ago, gets put back into put back in prison. So now his life is on, on a downward spiral once again. And, you know, and it just shows me that for the folks we work with, former gang members and felons trying to change your life, there are so many hurdles that society throws at them that, my gosh, there's got to be a better way and there's got to be a change. But that was like the first brush at, for me, experiencing the struggles of our population. There's an amazing story, Tom, from the book that, and I'm, I don't remember the person's name, but they were an amazing salesperson and they were going to the, the market every weekend yeah, sure. and they were like the top person. And can you tell that story and, and what happened? Cause it's kind of a similar, similar thing. Yeah, George. Yeah. So we have at homeboy industries, we have, um, Farmers markets. And, uh, you know, a good part, let me first say about Homeboy, we help former gang members and felons change their life. And what I learned from Father Greg, the founder of Homeboy, and still, still there leading us along the way, is that all these folks are victims of complex trauma at a young age. They join the gang thinking it's going to be their, their family, their friends, but it's not. It's a false hope. Right. And so people have to, have to come out of the, when they come out of the prison system, they're choosing to leave that gang lifestyle. And they, again, they want to sort of, do it the right way, but they have no support system around them to pull themselves out of gangs. What Homeboy does is provide that support system. So a lot of what we do is provide the, the healing and the therapies, but a good portion of what we do is work therapy since 90% of our population, which is former felons and, and inmates, have never worked in their life for more than a month. So if you think about it, this side story on commentary in our society, releasing tens of thousands of people out of the prison system each year in California, and to think that a government agency with, is going to help them with, do a little resume and get them a job and for them to keep the job when they've never worked anywhere else. They have so many challenges in terms of how to get mainstream back into life, let alone not knowing how to work. So what Homeboy does is both. We help them heal and we help them know how to work. So big part of teaching them how to work is the work in our social enterprises. <laughs> Long wind up to the story. So uh, we, have, we have a bakery. Uh, and in our bakery, we send our guys out to there's 26 farmers markets around the county of Los Angeles, and we sell our bread. And it's a good job in the sense of teaching somebody how to interact with customers who aren't like them uh, and just sell the bread and eye contact and all. So our, our bakery, and so it's farmers markets, it's run by our trainees, which are clients, we call our clients trainees, you know, each day, they, they, they have the guy in charge of each farmer's market picks up the bread from the bakery, drives out in our vans, sets up a table, sells the bread, brings the cash back in, hands it back, hands the cash in. Any corporate auditor would have a heart attack looking at the lack of processes we have and controls we have in place. But it works for us because people care about homeboy. They're not going to they're not going to abuse us. So, OK, so George, one of our best farmer's market um, um, sellers, always sells out his bread. Uh, and so I remember this is probably like two or three months into my time at Homeboy. You know, I, I walk through the bakery, you know, it's leadership. I walk around, you chat with people, you talk to them. And I overhear George talking to our bakery manager saying he needs to take the weekend off, the Fridays, Saturday, Sunday markets, which are our best markets. And he was asking for the time off. And so I'm thinking, I'm, you know, I just came out of corporate America. I'm thinking, oh, well, he must be taking vacation days and you know, doing something worthwhile on his vacation uh, along the way. I said, oh, George, what, what's going on? Uh, he said, well, um, he says, I, I have a, still have a lot of debt from prison. So this was a time when people come out of jail or prison. You have to pay, you have to pay not just restitution for your crime, but, but you have to pay the parole officer that was working with. You have to pay your court costs. And so for society, again, we have people in prison. They, we're putting all these debts on 
court costs, parole officer costs, DA costs, and people coming out of prison have to pay that debt. And so for George, to pay that debt, there was a time where you can report into his county jail and burn off that, those dollars you will by spending three days in prison. And so he was doing a responsible thing. I'm thinking, so I walk, I'm thinking he's saying he's reporting into prison just to pay off. And so I'm walking away thinking that's a very responsible thing. He's trying to do, do what's, what, what society wants him to do is to do it correctly, but he's got to go to prison for it. And I'm thinking, wow, I wonder if I would have made that choice or if I would have tried to find them, find the money. All right. So, so I see him now the following Monday and I say, Hey, you know, how'd it go? You know, I was th- thinking about you all weekend. He's, oh, it, it was a struggle. So I'm thinking he's going to tell me something happened in the jail. And then he says, I, and then he says, well, he was worried the whole time because the person, now he's a single father of, of a 10 year old and an eight year old. The person who was going to watch his two children couldn't make it. And so he went to jail, left his 10 year old and eight year old in their apartment for three days on their own thinking about, and he spent the whole time thinking about, are they going to be okay? Now, it turns out they were okay. But the point of my story is two things. The struggles that for people who are trying to get out of being poor and get out of being a felon to move forward is just massive. But the other point of story I've come to learn the homeboy is, you just got to, it's impossible for folks who grew up the way I grew up, right? pretty typical in the United States. You can't, our tendency is to judge his decision, George's decision making right there. And we we're, we're, we're learn homeboys, it's almost impossible set of choices our folks deal with. And so it's a good reminder. Let's not judge. Let's just figure out how we change the system and improve it going forward. Because people get put in awful circumstances to try to sort of make their life better. You know, it, it's when I was reading that, it was really a heart wrenching type of story. And let's say there's someone within the homeboy industries there that has maybe some extra money or has the means to do that. How do you stop yourself from just stepping in and helping every, I mean, you can't help every single person. You're like, I just wanted, when I read that, I was like, I just wanted to give him the money. So he wouldn't have to go into, go back in and pay that debt by going into jail again. Yeah, it's very hard. Uh, and that's some, yeah, it's how, where do you draw on that line? Right. I mean, I, you know, it, did it go through my brain when I walked away that first time he said he was going to jail? Hell, maybe I should just sort of give him the money. I didn't even know how much it was probably like over a thousand dollars, but it's not that big a deal. But it's like, how do you think about it? So let me tell you another story that along about money does make it. So the, one of the themes of my book is money makes a difference for poor people. You know, it's like we have this adage, well, you know, money doesn't make a difference in life. Well, for poor people who are struggling with so many things, it makes a difference. Homeboy, for many years, we struggle, struggle financially in the sense we have very generous donors, but our mission is to help as many people as possible. And so we run payroll to payroll and month to month, and it's not a lot of resources in the bank. And we actually, oftentimes, we would loan money to people, we would give money to people. And so, but this time, this next story, we just didn't have money. And then and there was a story of Pauline, and this is one of the driver forces of why I keep showing up every day. African-American woman, multiple stints in jail, a gang member, a lot of drug addiction, and, and a little bit of mental illness. But when she was on her meds of mental, she was a good worker. She was friendly. She would be engaging, but then she would struggle and, and she would struggle trying to get by. And so there was one time she came to our case manager and asked, you know, because she had she owed five hundred dollars to get her around five hundred dollars to get her car out of uh, to fix her car and get her car out of the, the lot. And it's important for our folks to have cars because taking public transportation generally means they have to drive through rival gang territories, which makes it very dangerous for them. So having a car is an important way for them to get safely to us or wherever else they're going. And so she asked on this Thursday, can she borrow money? Uh, and that is to the case manager. And at that time, Homeboy didn't have any of those re- financial reserves. And so we said, no, but you know, maybe on Monday, you know, we're expecting more donations to come in. Maybe on Monday, we would have the money. And so um, uh, Monday comes al- along. And for Pauline, it's, you know, so it's, she's, so she comes into Monday morning and she's crying with her case manager, feeling like such shame. And what she did was she was forced in such a tough spot. She, for her, she uh, uh, went to prostitution. She prostituted herself to earn the money to get, so she could get the car so she can drive safely. 
And it's like, it's again, it's like this struggle of like the choices people, uh, our society of putting people in. Now, I'm not saying Pauline doesn't have her problems, but we're, there's no support structure around for Pauline. And the other thing that Pauline has been sick and she passed away a couple of years ago. She had heart, she had heart problems. She went for heart surgery. She came back out. Uh, she came back to work a couple months later. She was, you know, either rolling, you either get the, the smile, the big smile and the embracing of what you're about, or you get the pain of what she's going through in terms of the trauma. And she was very, always respectful for me. And we were always very engaging to me. Uh, but then like two months later, she passed away. And I know deep down that if she was my daughter, I would find a way. Healthcare in America is different for There's two Americas, one for the poor and one for everybody else. In my America, I probably, if she was my daughter, I would probably find some way of getting her health care. But being poor, you don't, you don't get those opportunities. So it's to your spirity question, it's hard. Where do you draw the line? Where do you sort of extend yourself? I mean, we we'll all extend ourselves, but how do you kind of help people out? And it's to me, my big theme here is how do you, as a society, as businesses, we need to change the way we think about the poor, the working poor and the formerly incarcerated and how to help them. Tom, talk about the different social enterprises. Cause I know it started off with, um, because there was a bakery that happened to be across the street from the church. And so that was the initial social yeah. enterprise, right? So talk sure. about where it started and then kind of what is there now and how it's grown. Yeah. Yeah. So it started simply as uh, father Greg, a Jesuit priest, his first, uh, station as a priest was in Dolores Mission, which is the poorest parish in all of Los Angeles archdiocese along the way. And also, this is back in the late 80s, early 90s, epicenter of gang violence. And so, you know, there's in, in Dolores Mission, there's probably 10 or dif 10 different gangs all around that area. Greg saw these young men just violent and, and killing themselves, and he wanted to come up with a way of getting them out of that situation. And he hit upon the, such a simple notion. If you get them a job where they have enough money for food and shelter, they're not going to run with the gang to get that money for food and shelter. It's, you know, basic needs, food and shelter along the way. And so that's how it started. And then um, it was an opportunity to, to uh, buy a bakery. And the, one of the famous movie producers, Ray Stark, read about Father Greg's story, came down, asked Greg, how can we help? And Greg said, well, it's a bakery across the street. How about having a bakery? But fundamentally, what Greg knew was purposeful activity for people. And have gang members work side by side. You know, in our bakery today, we uh, we make artisan bread. We have eleven route, bread routes to go around the county. And we deliver to restaurants, but it's handmade. And so, guys who are rival gang members are rolling dough right next to each other, right on the tables in our bakery. And it's a it's a wonderful sort of work therapy in the sense of 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 how to help people understand what it's not just about working, but work with work with your rival. So um, that's how the bakery started. Now, from there, we have our homegirl cafe. So it's a more of a women's only business. Women who are gang affiliated or gang involved uh, run a cafe. And I like to say, you know, we are a Zagat rated cafe. We're downtown Los Angeles. Uh, we have, there's only eight other restaurants in downtown Los Angeles that have as high of a rating as we do. And it's run, and I'm saying the Zagat rated is run by former gang members and felons, period, all through the management team. Or, or our clients. And so to speaks to, you give somebody a chance in the way normal society thinks about it, they, they can do a good job. Yeah. And, and I guess that my, my point is, there's other in downtown Los Angeles with Zagat ratings, but ours is run by former felons and, and gang members. And which is, which is sort of another lesson or the, what I want to tell everybody is that here we have a population, former felons, formerly incarcerated, who most of America, most businesses don't look to hire. But I'm running social enterprise businesses, and they're not just the frontline workers, bro, but they're the management teams, and they're driving those businesses forward and driving those businesses forward successfully. And so um, it, what I'm saying is, you know, here's a population that uh, we should invest in and try uh, to get them better, better jobs and move them up the economic ladder, uh, without a doubt. So we also have Homeboy Electronic Recycling, and, and here in the state of California, uh, every, every electronic item should be recycled cycle properly. And so we have a electronic recycling company. We actually acquired a smaller version of this. It was smaller about four years ago, and we've grown it nicely since then. And here's we, we pick up people's electronic waste. We take it back to our factory or our warehouse. We de deconstruct it and sell the components along the way, as well as refurbish computers and, and sell them. So we look to see how that business can keep on growing. And then we have smaller businesses, uh, food businesses. We have a diner in City Hall. 
Uh, we're going to have one in the new LA County Behavioral Health Center along the way. And then you, you already mentioned our silk screening, screen printing operation with our homeboy merchandise as well. So, so we're running these social enterprise businesses. Um, not only are they training programs, but also that they can grow and, and provide good jobs for, for, our, for our graduates of our program. So how did you decide to grow into these different uh, niches, right? Like electronic recycling. Yeah, it almost happens. Um, uh, let me say it this way. So because of Homeboy, so many people support Homeboy Industries and they know that we, we employ people. Most of society doesn't employ a lot of folks, good hearted folks come to us with business ideas. And so mm. thankfully we've had a choice. We've had to be able to pick and choose among some good opportunities along the way. But the aspects for me, what I've come to learn is you know, I married together my for-profit world with my nonprofit world, is that we want for Homeboy, we want to have businesses that are people dependent, you know, labor dependent. You know, we don't want to be in the software business where we're just selling vaporware, right? We need something where people come in and, and uh, you know, work at it and, and be able to use their hands and their, their minds along the way. And we also want businesses that have upward mobility that can keep growing because it's very important for us, you know, this all issue in society, thankfully, the last couple of years is about providing economic justice. Well, to me, that's getting them a quality job that has upward mobility so they can provide for their families. And so if we're in a growth business and and a part of that business actually can uh, contract with local state government, uh, that's even better because we don't get really state or government funds along the way to do what we're doing. We're privately funded through donors and through our businesses. But if our business can can contract with the city or county, uh, that would be that would be a good aspect of it. And so as we think about what businesses we want to grow into is, do they need people? Do we see upward mobility for our clients? And uh, do we, can we see some sales growth putting the Homeboy brand on top of it? I want to talk about, um, you know, the whole process kind of soup to nuts. You know, when someone comes in and applies to the hiring process, to the training process and everything like that. But um, talk about the breakdown because the the in, the enterprises make a fair amount of revenue on their own. So you have donations and and the revenue from the businesses. Right, right. Um, well, let me quickly answer that. So we're we're about a twenty five million dollar organization. Uh, not, we're a nonprofit, so we bring in twenty five million dollars and spend twenty five million dollars. Uh, of that, uh, eight million is our revenue from our social enterprise businesses. Uh, about two million. Uh, is from government, all forms of government, uh, city, state, federal, county. And then the balance, uh, which is $15, $16 million, is uh, donor support. That's either foundations or individual donors. And and we're blessed with so many generous donors who really believe in what we do about giving people not just second chances, but first chances in life and organize it that way. So that's how we're set up from a financial standpoint to your question of how people come into Homeboy. I, the reason I ask this is because it's like when I was reading in the book and I'm going to have you explain it, but there's thousands of people. I don't know the number that you have to turn away and you have to choose between it's it's sometimes, you know, bring someone in is a life or death thing for someone to survive, you know, to come in. And it's it's to turn people away has got to be very tough. And, and to not turn people away is you just you know, it's a revenue thing, right? You just, yeah. ha- you have to have the revenues to sustain it. So talk about that. Like how many people are coming in? How are they coming in? Are they just walking in the front door? How does that w- look logistically um, when people apply? And and then how does the process work? Yeah, sure. Let me, I'll say that. Let me first say to your point, how tough it is. And just put in a frame of reference, you know, it's in corporate America. I worked at, I ran a $1.8 billion set of businesses. 18,000 people worked for me. You know, I came to Homeboy, we were around $11 million at the time. I, there's been more stress and strain in my time at Homeboy, you know, running an $11, $15 million, now $25 million nonprofit, then a <laughs> $1.8 billion business. Not because we have less resources now, but because we know, I know if we don't make the right decisions and have to cut our labor force, that's cutting people out of our program and they're going back uh, to the streets, running with the gangs, causing violence. And it's a tough, tough call. So to the, to the question of, um, listen, so we're here in L.A. County. Um, there's over uh, 200 different gangs, 150,000 gang members in L.A. County. Uh, L.A. County, unfortunately, is the uh, is gang central for the United States and almost for the world along the way. But when people come out of the, when these men and women come out of the jail system, prison system, and my, here's my, my interpretation of it. 
they know all their life. They, they don't want to be in a gang. They don't want to be doing a crime. They're just kind of stuck into this and they can't get out of it, right? And so they leave the prison system. They need something different. And they know if they can come walk through our doors as a homeboy, we can we not only represent hope, but we could offer them some tangible effort to help them not run back with the gang. So we have two parts of what we do at homeboy. We have our paid program where we hire 300 people and they're on our payroll every, every day, 300 people working in our businesses and working on themselves. And we have what we call community clients where they come in and take you know, advantage of our services for free. Uh, everything's for free. So whether it's tattoo removal, you know, we take out 12,000 tattoos a year or whether it's anger management, DV, counseling, AA, NA, and that type of thing. So, but around 15 people interview each week they become part of our paid program. And just the way the turnover works for many of the years is of those 15, we can only take one or two, right? And to your point about the money. And so- Do they walk in the door, front door? Like, how does that- No, so they come in, you know, Father Greg still um, goes to a lot of youth camps, which is youth jails, and uh, does Saturday services. And so they have his business card and they walk, yes, they walk in the front door and say, I want to be part of Homeboy. We have a very welcoming environment. If anybody is in LA, come visit us. There's a real good energy there. You, we have our, our folks run the system, right? run, you know, over half our management team are former clients. And so, uh, you know, a person will walk through the door and say, I want a job. They think it's a, they, that's what they ask for. But really, we, we provide more than a job. We, we provide help. They help, you know, transform their pain and, and help them heal from their trauma. But they start interviewing for a job, which means they, uh, the, the interview for a job, you have to test that you're drug free, uh, substance free. Uh, you have to have been um, in a gang and you have to have been incarcerated. So we have three sort of basic criteria. And then once they get through those three basic criteria, then they go to what's called selection committee. And I try to be on as many selection committees as possible. I bring other board members in this experience and, and sometimes some outsiders. And at that committee, uh, and we have other case managers with us as well. What we ask the person is, why do you want to become part of homeboy? Mm-hmm. We're looking, and really what we're looking, we're doing reverse cherry picking, as Father Greg would say. We're looking for the hardest of the hard case, because we know if we're not helping them, there's nowhere else in LA County that's, that's helping these folks. But if someone comes in and they sort of have a little education and they seem they can, you know, they have a family support and they seem they can get by on their own, we make that decision that, well, come take advantage of our programs, but yeah, we're, we're going to give the job to, the, to this other person who has no other support. And so uh, we go out of our way to take the hardest of hard cases, which means that we don't like, unfortunately, a lot of nonprofits just by nature of getting government funding have to prove your results all the time. And so thereby instinctively, if you always have to hit government statistics, you're not taking the hardest of the hard case because you know, you're going to quote unquote wash out. Right. But we go out of our way uh, to take that person who's the hardest of hard cases. And lo and behold, we're successful with them too. Let me give you this one statistic. A number of years ago, UCLA did ran a study on our effectiveness of homeboy, independently funded study. It showed if someone was part of homeboy industries, you know, our, prof, our client profile, two years later, they only have a 30% recidivism rate. That means going back into the jail system under their new charge. 30%, that's versus a statewide average of 70%. So we're t- over two times better than the statewide average. And we're privately funded. We do it our own way. And we take the hardest of the hard cases uh, along the way. But the stress is on this uh, is on our organization because when you have to say turn someone away, you can't give them that job. It's heartbreaking sometimes because you just know what's going to happen. You just know where they're we're heading to next. So you they go through this process, then you end up hiring them. What happens when they come on as far as the training goes? Because like yeah. you said, most of these people have not had a job longer than a month. Yeah. So sure. And and. and, and I'll try to say this quickly. So in essence, people are with Homeboy. That's the other thing. People with Homeboy are about 18 months. It takes a long time to, to overcome all the challenges our folks have and, and to start healing from the trauma that they've experienced. So we're not a 30-day program or a government-funded 90-day program. We are a, we're here to help people in many, many different ways. So when they first come in, it's about building relationships to, your, to the words you so well put at the beginning of this. It's trusting relationships because these folks have never had anybody support them in their life, anybody invest in them, anybody who welcomes them. And so what Homeboy is about is it's, it's, this, it's this radical kinship, it's compassion. And through relationships, they start opening up and healing. So their day, what their day looks like, though, is we pay them to, to go to their, their anger management class. We pay them to go to their NA class. We pay them to get their tattoos removed, to go to GED. Uh, and then about of their two hours of their day, they're out washing windows and sweeping floors of homeboy. 
And they do that for four or five months. And then eventually, then they we move that it flips, they move into our social enterprise businesses. And about two thirds of the day, they're working in the businesses, baking bread, you know, washing dishes in the cafe, uh, making, you know, making food in the cafe. And about one third, they're going back for their classes, their therapy, their mental health counseling along the way to eventually after 18 months, then we get them a job outside of homeboy. I want to pause for a second for the first part of the training. You know, part of it is the rehabilitation part. Like you said, the angle management, the narcotics anonymous, the alcohols anonymous, whatever it is that they, the, the tattoo uh, removal. But the first part you start is just making sure homeboy is clean, looks good. And you talk about in the book about subordination. <laughs> yeah. Can you just talk about that? Because I think that relates to this part of the yeah, training. Yeah, so certainly if, as um, I'm advocating for everybody to hire our population, right? But it comes with like, you have to think about it differently. And when I, it took me a while. There's a lot of head spinning for me to think how, what I need to think about differently. And one is insubordination. And so here's this one story. Uh, 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 I remember Gary telling this story uh, to other, he's now a nav- navigator mentoring other new folks in the program. I heard him tell him the story that when he first came in the homeboy, right, his supervisor, Jose, his, his, his navigator, Jose, uh, said, hey, Gary, there's some trash over there. Can you go, can you, come on, can you go pick that up and come on this way? <laughs> and, and Gary turns to him and says, you saw it first, you pick it up. <laughs> now, yeah. It's sort of funny to hear it, but it, that actually happened. I mean, it happened with like in, in real anger, right? And so our folks all their life been, have been, have fingers wag at them, told what to do, told them they're not good enough, right? And so, in, what, and so what we've come to learn is what, you got to get what's behind insubordination. What happened that day? I mean, what, what kind of baby mama drama was there? What, what kind of like hassles did they get from the parole officer? I mean, in, there's something beyond the insubordination. No one just wants to be insubordinate just to be, you know, mm-hmm. mean that. So, so I've come to learn is that well, you, to help our folks out, you, you, just, don't, you just don't interpret their act, actions and behaviors. You get, what driving those behaviors is, is an important lesson coming from homeboy uh, is to understand. I mean, in part of the book you talk about, is it that the person sees it as beneath them to do that type of thing? Or what's... There's part of that. And that's why it's so, you know, you would get our folks with lived experience who now are our managers and senior managers. Uh, they go out of the way to talk about you got to humble yourself. Mm-hmm. They had to humble themselves, that there's no job beneath them. That's why you see a lot of our managers sort of get down there and clean the bathrooms with our folks, right? And that's not about kind of like oppressive type of humbling yourself. It's come on, we have to, we have to change the way of thinking about things. You know, we have to start taking care of ourselves along the way. I want to talk about, so what happens after the 18 months, but yeah, it reminds me, I was um, listening to uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar wrote a book about his life lessons from John Wooden. Um, And now, you know, we're talking about UCLA for a second. And uh, he talks about how, you know, and is cleaning up the garbage in the visitors in their locker room, even though it's not their, you know, their visitors. Mm -hmm. And that's just the type of person he was. It's just, it, it wasn't too low for him after a huge game just to clean up make sure all the, the picking up trash after his you know players are in the locker room you know so it reminds me of that um what happens after the 18 months so now they go through the program yeah they go through the program and it's, um we have a workforce development team and we uh get them jobs after they leave us after 18 months and um and this is where our, the next evolution of the homeboy is coming about and but I talk about the path forward is, uh, unfortunately, we've only been able to get our folks really minimum wage jobs as they leave homeboy. And I know just by looking at the businesses we run that our folks are more talented than that. And so what mm-hmm. we're now trying to do is push forward on growing more homeboy businesses so that then we, so that we can not just, we'll still get them jobs outside of homeboy, but we want to take our graduates, quote unquote, and, and get them jobs within our growing uh, business enterprises mm-hmm. as well. And so that's why we're pushing behind homeboy recycling. Um, in fact, I started fundraising for it. You know, I was trying to take, take all the lessons you learn from the business world, right? And so you, you gather up money and you see them grow. And so, you know, as I said before, Homeboy's blessed with a lot of generous donors. And a lot of these are very self-made um, entrepreneurs who, who, who did well and they, they sold their companies and now they're, they're giving back. And so they would say to me multiple times over the years, Tom, I'm going to keep on give, giving the Homeboy, but if you ever come up with a business idea, I'm willing to deploy my capital to help out. Yeah. And so, so I've sort of taken them up on this. And so we have is our, it's our Homeboy Ventures and Jobs Fund. It's a $15 million fund organized like a venture fund along the way. Mm-hmm. The difference is, though, the profits stay back into the Homeboy mothership. 
but we've raised 11 other $15 million and we want to add on more homeboy type businesses so that we can provide jobs for our people, quality jobs, which means, you know, predictable scheduling, decent wages, benefits, upward mobility along the way, all the stuff that the rest of America sees that I want us to see for our, our people. And it's, and it's proven successful. And homeboy recycling is now one of those types of growth businesses. We have a feed hope initiative. We're preparing meals and selling to the, to the, to the county. So our goal going forward is to create uh, more businesses so we can have more jobs for our folks as they graduate out of Homeboy. I want to talk about your kind of growing those business in the corporate world. Um, but talk for a second about some of the business ideas that you get and what are some of the ones that maybe um, you may execute in the future that sound interesting, maybe you haven't yet. Um, what are some ones that come across the table? Because I'm sure it's like uh, an idea person, you're like, well, this sounds like a great idea. Let's put it on the roadmap for a couple of years from now. What yeah, sticks sure. out I mean, look, I, you I'll, tell you what's, I'll tell you what's right on our um, horizon here, whether you, you pull them off. So um, for many years, we've been training people, our, our folks, to be solar panel installation experts mm. or in, installers, right? And so what's great about that industry, it pays pretty well, $20, $25 an hour. Because there's so many installers needed, there's no barrier to having a felony in your record to stop you from getting hired. As long as you can pass the certification exam, you're hired. So we've done that for a number of years. Now we're, we're considering joint venturing with this other nonprofit into manufacturing solar panels here in Los Angeles County, which is, you know, there's not much solar panel manufacturing happening in the United States, mostly off, off, off shores. And, but there's a real push going forward with the government to make this a local effort. And so um, that would be a terrific set of jobs. Another, another industry that's, that's coming along and lost, and, well, all over, but really Southern California is this battery technology industry of having you know, these battery cells. And, 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 um, and so there's this burgeoning low voltage battery industry happening here in, in Los Angeles. Can we become the, the provider of the jobs um, for that uh, growing, growing enterprise along the way? And then back to the old fashioned one, uh, uh, selling, um, we call homeboy agriculture, but take, think about all the warehouses that are in downtown Los Angeles run down. How do you kind of redo that warehouse? So you, you grow plants hydroponically and sell, you know, the lettuces and the, and the tomatoes to the local restaurants. And so here you have this sort of regenerative type of, of business idea. So there's lots of those types of ideas. Key is finding, having the businesses needing labor to, to pull it off. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of one of the people I had on the podcast, which is how can, how can some of the workforce that you have be employed in these other industries? Uh, like Regrained was a, basically a, uh, it's a bar that they go around to the different breweries and uh, pick up the spent grain to transport, to make granola bars out of it or whatever it is. Sure, so, sure. It's like, so what's in the um, supply chain already that you and your team and company could plug into and do. So it's really, thank you for sharing those. Those are, those are super interesting. What comes to my mind is when I was reading the book is um, uh, tattoo removal. Mm -hmm. Do you all, can people come in and pay to do it? Or is it only for the people who are part of the uh, organization? It's not just um, anybody who needs it done for free. We, we'll take yeah. it. Now, if, if you can afford it, we ask for a donation along the way. You may, yeah, have, yeah. You may get frustrated because it takes a while to schedule it and all those things, but it's, it's really for our, yeah. our um, you know, and we're, we're blessed with 40 volunteer doctors who do that work That's for great. us. And uh, yeah, that, that is great. I love it. Um, talk about, you know, right out of school, you had a lot of offers in a lot of different amazing companies, but you chose to go with a smaller company out of the bat. I'd love to hear about how you helped to grow that company. Yeah. Look, I was a, uh, I was a math major <laughs> in college. I went to get my master's in mathematical sciences. And so, um, right. Had an opportunity to go work at like the NSA or American Airlines, seven of those job offers. But I went for a small, what intrigued me was uh, a be more entrepreneur, small mail order company out of, out of New England. And it was a perfect spot for a guy who was a math guy because at the end of the day, it is back in the 80s, right? Yeah, catalog world, you know how many catalogs you mailed out and how many orders you got back. You did all the statistical analysis. And, and so I started my career on more about 100 million. And it was a family-run business and had all the, the pluses and minuses of a family-run business. 
but had but a big uh, Aramark Corporation came came by and bought it, and then uh, I was fortunate enough to be in a senior leadership position. So that when Aramark bought it, they invested in me as a leader, and so I then grew up through a big multi billion dollar uh, corporate world and, and went up the corporate ladder that way. But um, but all along, it's about how do you take the how do you take what you learn and and bring your work your teammates along and uh, and, and enjoy the success as a as a as a complete unit. And that's what kind of moves. If you know how to make money and lead people, <laughs> you have upward mobility in corporate America for sure. You know, going in that um, mail, first of all, I, I geek out on direct response related stuff. So I, I love <laughs> that you, you. Oh, we can have a deeper dialogue now. <laughs> I, I, I love that stuff. And I've had some people on the podcast that just, you know, also direct response, copywriting, all that. And it's amazing because you see the input in, you see the output. But then you see, you know, what the result was, what were some of the key lessons or things that helped grow that company from 50 million to 300 million? Well, certainly it was looking, it was about the same thing about the being smart, right? I mean, so having the, the smart marketing approach, investing in the, the statistical technology, statistical marketing efforts. Uh, But I'd also say that it was a committed management team. It was very young. A lot of folks just left business school and and started this company up. And it was that kind of taught me that if you have a culture that's driven towards everybody's sort of driven to to you know rowing the boat in the same way, right? Uh, you can be with a good idea with hard work, you can be successful. If you don't have a good idea, it's not going to work. If you don't work hard, it's not going to get there. Fifty so million need, to three hundred million, kind of or one million to fifty million, or whatever. Was there something deeper that helped kind of drive that growth? Um, I mean, that's amazing growth. Well, yeah, I mean, so so I did that. Um, and then I went to another company where we sold police and fire equipment through the mail. And we grew that from, you know, same thing, 50 million to 270 million. Right. And so I guess the, the theme of your question is we were doing, we were doing marketing different than everybody else in the industry was doing. So if you're just doing it the same with everybody else, it's going to be hard to do. But if you're, if you're actually providing a, a better marketing and providing the product at, at the right cost and they're smart about the way you're buying it, you're out competing. It's, so it's as simple as out competing your competitors. You have a better business model, better mm-hmm. mousetrap. And then with that, then having the right team in place, that's what makes the difference. Back to Homeboy for a second, Tom, there's, there's so many challenges to running a business in general. And now you layer that on top of all the challenges that the individuals are experiencing. And you mentioned culture and, uh, Teammates. Well, sometimes you have people come in to work with Homeboy and they're enemies, right? They're rivals. How do you navigate that when they come into Homeboy? Yeah. Uh, and that's where our team um, is just phenomenal at it. I mean, we, and that's the, the, the value of having people with lived experience be part of your uh, team leadership. And it's sort of, um, it's also the having a strong culture of there's, uh, it, we don't, Look, we 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 help the gang member, right? We come out of gangs. We don't we don't work with gangs. We work with the person. And so when we we're really clear, whenever there's whenever someone comes to new, when they start talking about the gang, we, our team just stops and dead in track. We don't talk about the gang. We don't talk about my homies. We don't say this is I'm going to do this because this is what my guy wants me to do. No, you're an individual who, who's that homeboy, and and we and we're here for you. We love you. We care for you. And those words may sound cliche. But it's so true that we actually care for that person more than anyone else has ever cared for them. And that is what wins the day and starts getting the person to stop thinking about their gang and more about themselves and their teammates all around. And big number one. Big number two is fundamentally, you can't demonize somebody you're in relationship with. And so that's the, the push to get them in relationship and, work, and working side by side rolling dough goes a long way to kind of breaking down those barriers. Tom, I want to be the first one to thank you. Thank you for sharing your journey. Everyone should check out the book um, and then also check out homeboyindustries.org. Are there any other places online that we should point people towards? You got it. Homeboyindustries.org is, is, has all our information. Awesome. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, thank everyone. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.